These people are Afrikaners, white South Africans of mixed Dutch, German, and French descent. They've been called the lost white tribe of Africa. Their peculiar genius has been survival. Against all odds, they have clung doggedly to the portion of Africa they claim as their own. Afrikaners will tell you that, unlike English-speaking South Africans, they have nowhere else to go. Their home and their destiny lie in South Africa. We do not want to in run any unnecessary risks. We, as Afrikaners, as the most important decision makers, must create the necessary safeguards that the society as it is must be continued, that our uh, existence as whites in Africa must be permanent. Afrikaners say they are tough and pragmatic, but they may in fact be the last romantics. To understand the present South African situation, apartheid, white intransigence, it is necessary to know how the Afrikaner character developed and how this people came to power. The Four Trucker Monument outside South Africa's capital, Pretoria, is a shrine to Afrikaner nationalism, the Afrikaner's highly emotional sense of being a unique people, the folk, with a special destiny in Africa. Afrikaners have a peculiar mythology derived from their uncompromising religious and racial beliefs and a pioneering history. For them, the past lives on and dictates the decisions of the present. The Four Trucker Monument is enclosed in a circle of covered wagons known as a lager. For Afrikaners, the central image in their historical memory is this lager, an armed camp surrounded by enemies with guns poking out from behind the covered wagons. In the three centuries that the Afrikaner has been in Africa, this image of the lager has changed, but it is still alive. For the lager is above all a state of mind which sees enemies everywhere and tries to protect against them. Numerically, of course, the Afrikaner constitutes a very small group. And uh, secondly, we feel as uh, a group that we are being threatened by outside forces. We uh, perceive uh, the outside world, or we used to perceive the outside world, as being hostile in a sense to us. The earliest form of the lager was a prickly hedge planted by the first Dutch settlers around their tiny settlement at the southwest tip of Africa to keep out Hottentots. Thus, from the beginning, they established a racial barrier between those of European origin, the Boers, and native Africans, whom the Boers called Kaffirs, unbelievers. In an age of slavery, the Boer farmer used slave labor. He became essentially an overseer who shunned the manual work of his slaves. His rigid Calvinism told him that his mission in Africa was to protect white Christian civilization from the barbarian. One should remember that the Afrikaners regarded themselves just like the New Englanders as a chosen people, you know. This is rooted in the Old Testament, in Protestant religion, Calvinism especially. And in the interior of South Africa, they only had the Bible as literature because of their isolation from the uh, West and from the mother country, or, well, they were actually cut off from Holland. So they got their ideas from directly from the Bible. Some ideas in regard even to the Mennonites, which they regard as Canaanites, and themselves as, uh, as uh, the chosen people with a mission. The Afrikaner's dilemma was this. He has needed black muscles to work the land for him, but he has always lived in fear that those same muscles would one day take the land from him. This created a push-pull effect. Keep the Kaffir in his place, and his place is working for the white boss. In the 19th century, British imperial rule expanded to southern Africa. They interfered very little with the frontier life of the Boers until 1834, when they ordered the abolition of slavery. For Afrikaners, this meant the ruin of their economy based on slave labor. And it was seen as a first step towards miscegenation, which would destroy them as a people, a folk. 
In 1836, in an extraordinary gesture of self-reliance and courage, 2,000 Boers crossed the Orange River into the wilderness, out of the bondage of British rule, searching for free land in which to form a republic. This movement northwards is called the Great Trek. Not all the Boers trekked out. Most remained behind under British rule. This split among Afrikaners was to persist for a century. Those who trekked had to be tough to survive. Called the poor trekkers, they have a romantic place in the hearts of Afrikaners. They were pioneers to the backbone and it was just uh, rough going. They were tough men coming down the, the mountains. Uh, my grandmother, when I was still a youngster, told me how her father and her great father, grandfather told her how they came down the mountains by stripping the wheels off and skidding the wagons down the Drakensberg. And where it was very steep, they used to put the two big wheels on the one side and the two small wheels, because the wagon has two small wheels in front and two big wheels at the back. And this is where, how they sort of balanced out. And uh, they went over the Drakensberg in the same spirit. They, they were really opening up Africa, as a matter of fact. The poor truckers pushed into lands the Zulu considered theirs and the many clashes are the fabric of Afrikaner mythology in which the savagery and treachery of the Africans are contrasted with the heroism of the poor trekkers. According to the Afrikaner version of history, in 1838 a Boer party of 500 faced a Zulu army 10,000 strong. At the end of the battle, a nearby river ran red with the blood of 3,000 Zulus, slain by Boer cannon and muskets. The Boers, fighting for the lager, had not lost a single man. Blood River showed what a small band of disciplined and well-armed men could accomplish. The lesson has not been forgotten. Today, the white man in South Africa rules because he has the guns, and he's willing to use them. In the wilderness, the Boers established their independent republics, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal, each with its elected president. The constitution of the Transvaal stated that the people desire no equality between the colored people and the white inhabitants, either in church or state. But the Boers' farm economy continued to depend on black labor. It was the Boers' misfortune that the Transvaal contained the richest gold deposits in the world, the Rand. The Boers had trekked over half of southern Africa to get away from the British. Now the British coveted the gold-rich Transvaal. The Boers could either capitulate or fight. They chose to fight the foremost imperialist power in the world to keep their republic. The Boers knew the terrain, were highly mobile, tough, and resourceful. Above all, they were fighting for their homeland against bands of commandos who probably totaled no more than 40,000 at any one time. The British sent over a quarter of a million troops. The British waged an incompetent and bungling campaign and stumbled their way to victory. Frustration at the commando's success drove the British to burn the Boer farms, the source of the guerrilla's food supplies. They herded the homeless women and children into concentration camps. Only 5,000 Boers died in battle, but in the camps, in appalling conditions, 5,000 adults died and 20,000 children. For Afrikaners, the lager, the armed camp, is the symbol of invincibility. The concentration camp, the symbol of their degradation. In 1902, in order to survive as a folk, the Boers had to surrender. Over half a century later, Afrikaners erected a memorial to their defeat. A fallen warrior lies with a dagger in his heart but from the heart springs a powerful spirit of steel, a gleaming sword in his hand, representing the rise of a new triumphant Afrikaner nation. In victory, the British imposed a parliamentary system on South Africa, excluding most non-whites. But Afrikaners outnumbered those of British origin. They might win by the ballot what they had lost by the bullet if they could apply the motto of their lost republic, unity makes strength. In 1914, the National Party was formed to build Afrikaner unity against continuing British domination. Its leader, General Herzog, whose slogan was, South Africa first. Herzog had said, 
only one person has the right to be boss in South Africa, namely the Afrikaner. The people feel their own power. They have reached nation manhood, and they feel that Afrikaners and not strangers should rule the country. The devastation of the Anglo-Boer War had created a class of poor whites who scraped subsistence from the soil. Destitute, virtually their one remaining possession was their white skin. During the early decades of this century, drought and soil erosion drove these poor white Afrikaners off their land into the cities they looked upon as the devil's own, seeking the very manual jobs they had despised as fit only for blacks. This mass migration became known as the Second Great Trek. But in the cities, Afrikaners were strangers in their own country. South Africa's economic strength lay in her mines, diamonds, gold, coal, iron ore, and the mines were British-owned. White workers, called civilized labor, had always been paid more than blacks and had all the best jobs. The myth of racial superiority paid off in hard cash. But in 1921, the price of gold fell. Mine owners said they had to cut costs by employing cheaper blacks in jobs reserved for whites only. The white miners, terrified by what they called the black peril, seized the British mines. Their slogan was, workers of the world unite to keep South Africa white. The government crushed the revolt. The strikers were bombed, shelled, and machine gunned into submission. More than 200 whites died. Four of the rebellion's leaders went to the gallows singing the red flag. The white miners had been broken. But within two years, white workers voted General Herzog into power. Herzog promised protection against both British capitalists and competition from blacks. During the 20s and 30s, the government established powerful state monopolies like ISCOR, the Iron and Steel Corporation of South Africa, to break the British monopoly of economic power. After all, Afrikaners have essentially over this period of this century since the Boer War, run a revolution against British dominance in South Africa. It's even a continuing revolution. The color bar for the first time got the backing of law. It became illegal for a black man to lay a brick. By the end of the 30s, Afrikaners were finally reaching the unity which would guarantee them full political power in South Africa when Britain declared war on Germany. And the opportunity was there in 1939 to remain neutral. But Smuts, with a very small parliamentary majority, decided that we should side with Britain and f help to fight her wars again against a nation, Germany, against which we had nothing. We simply said that we should have stayed out of the war as the Irish Republic had done. That this was a repetition of uh, the completely the completely mistaken attitude taken up by the government in 1914. And uh, we young people, I and thousands of others, more than 200,000 Afrikaners, formed the Osawa Brandwag and we resisted the government. Uh, we embarked on subversive schemes in order to hold within South Africa a large part of the military forces that Smuts could whip up. We were successful in many respects, but of course many of us were caught. Uh, many prominent people now in politics in South Africa, including the Prime Minister and myself, for instance, uh, were caught and we were interned and we were kept in internment during the entire course of the war. Smuts, the Prime Minister, aware of the danger of an uprising, confiscated all privately owned weapons and interned hundreds of Afrikaners under an emergency law. Oh yes, we were bent on revolution. We were waiting for the, the time when Britain would be conquered, be invaded and would lose the war. We would seize that opportunity in order to call out the Republic in South Africa and to divest us ourselves completely from the bonds with the British Empire. Afrikaners were divided once more. The nationalist leader, Dr. Malan, denounced Smuts saying 
he had turned South Africa into a Jewish imperialistic war machine. Yet a majority of South Africa's fighting troops were Afrikaners. Ironically, this war, opposed so bitterly by many Afrikaners, gave the final thrust to Afrikaner nationalism. In the massive effort to feed and equip the Allies, South Africa went through a boom period. There was plenty of work, and the influx of Afrikaners to the towns increased. Blacks also flocked to the towns and took jobs previously closed to them. By 1946, there were as many blacks as whites in the towns. Dr. Malan expressed his people's shock. In that new blood river, he said, black and white meet together in much closer contact and a much more binding struggle than when 100 years ago, the circle of wagons protected the lager and musket clashed with spear. Today, black and white jostle together in the same labor market. This resurgence of the black peril gave the National Party the formula for victory in the first post-war election, the apartheid election of 1948. To Afrikaners, it seemed that Smuts had not only sold out to Britain, but had gone soft on the blacks. While many young Afrikaners had been willing to fight in Smuts' British wars, none wanted their racial dominance undermined in any way. This threat finally united Afrikaners. The nationalists' platform said, if we reject the master race principle, and the non-Europeans are given the vote, how can the European remain boss? The European must retain the right to rule the country and keep it a white man's country. Dr. Milan's cabinet, the first composed purely of Afrikaners, began to implement the final answer to the black peril, apartheid, the complete separation of blacks from the white lager. Discrimination had always existed in South Africa, whatever white group was in power, but the nationalists now institutionalized it, depriving non-whites of any expectation of ever achieving equality with whites. Of course, given the situation, the situation as we find it here in South Africa, we had to exploit alternative means to solve the problems or to uh, restructure society without endangering the future of the whites. I mean, basically one may uh, did it about it, but it is a matter of white survival. In, I mean, and in that uh, phrase, I include very strongly Afrikaner survival. The emotional strength of Afrikaner nationalism was evident in 1949, when 250,000 Afrikaners made a triumphal pilgrimage to the Four Trucker Monument. Now united, the folk would decide South Africa's destiny. The years of division, of second-class citizenship, had conditioned Afrikaners to thinking of themselves as a people besieged. Built like a fortress, the Four Trucker Monument symbolized not just a people, but the state as lager. South Africa was an independent country within the British Commonwealth, but it was still subject to the crown, a figurehead hated by nationalists whose memory stretched back to the Anglo-Boer War, the concentration camps, and the lost republics. Yet Afrikaners and their thousands welcomed the royal family. While the British connection was there, Afrikaner loyalties would remain divided. So, in 1960, the nationalists held a referendum on whether South Africa should become a republic, no longer tied to Britain. English South Africans felt that this was the first step towards complete isolation from the rest of the world, and the bitter debate split the country, English versus Afrikaans. The nationalists carried the day. The Anglo-Boer War was finally won 60 years later by the Boers. That same year, 1960, British Prime Minister Macmillan spoke before Parliament in Cape Town at the end of an African tour. He warned that black nationalism was sweeping Africa. And the most striking of all the impressions that I've formed since I left London a month ago is of the strength of this African national consciousness. The wind of change is blowing through this continent. And whether we like it or not, this growth of national consciousness is a political fact. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> Macmillan's speech was prophetic. Within two months, Sharpville. A crowd of unarmed blacks demonstrating against the pass laws which restricted their freedom of movement were fired upon by the South African police. 69 were killed, 180 wounded. This was not the first time whites had shot down blacks. But Afrikaners saw it as a new threat. They had defeated the British only to be confronted with an ultimately more formidable enemy, the old black peril in the shape of black African nationalism. The National Party pervades Afrikaner society, from the grassroots level to the so-called Brotherhood, a secret society said to make all the important policy decisions in South Africa. The party is intimately linked to the Dutch Reformed Church, to the schools and universities, cultural organizations, certain trade unions, and Afrikaans newspapers. In addition, the nationalists have packed all branches of government with their supporters, the civil service, the police, military leadership, judgeships, prison warders, the secret police, are overwhelmingly Afrikaner. Out of a small white population of four million, there are over a million more Afrikaners than English speakers. With their ability to mobilize the Afrikaner vote and to a large degree mold public opinion, the nationalists increased their share of the popular vote throughout the 60s. They rendered all other parties impotent and even outlawed some. Once in power, the national party controlled the lawmaking process. Immediately, it began to manipulate the law, making it the major weapon of the lager. Every aspect of human activity, sport, sex, education, politics, was controlled. With every law enacted, the freedom of the individual was whittled away. The one standard the nationalists have set for themselves, by which everything is judged, is the security of the state. And since 1948, the state has meant the Afrikaner folk. That is the sole responsibility of the governing party and the people that govern. Because they know everything that's going on, they have been placed there by the people, and they have to see that the safety of the people, which is to them a holy matter placed in their hands, must not be in jeopardy. And therefore it is their full responsibility to decide at what stage the ordinary rights of the individual should and can and must be curtailed. There was protest after protest by black and white South Africans, but even protest became, in many ways, equated with treason. Unless you disperse immediately, I shall have to use force to disperse you. Despite their own experience as revolutionaries, the Afrikaner nationalists felt no sympathy for black nationalists. They saw them as rivals for political power, to be suppressed at all costs. Foremost among the National Party's measures to quell opposition was the Suppression of Communism Act of 1950. By this act, communism was defined so broadly as to include anything or anyone advocating racial equality. And therefore, any concept, even a Christian concept, where on the basis of one's Christian belief, you withstand the policy of separate development, could be seen you know, to be an offense under the suppression of communism act. In December 1956, in a nationwide roundup, the South African government arrested 156 persons of all races on charges of treason. The accused had called for equal rights for all citizens, black and white. The prosecution argued that this was incitement to violence, for, by Afrikaner logic, racial equality in South Africa could only be achieved by violence. The lager would allow for change in no other way. An act of intimidation to scare away anybody who might, might toy with the idea of um, using communist or communist ideology or tactics in order to uh, subvert the state. The courts, by and large, view and interpret the definition of communism in the light of the possible dangers that might arise if persons pursue the line of conduct that they are charged with. 
Control of subversive thoughts is as vital as control of subversive acts. For Afrikaners, communism is the antichrist, and liberal thinking will lead to the destruction of the race. Afrikaners have a term for those outside the lager. Volksfeyand, an enemy of the people. The Volksfeyand need commit no crime. Suspicion that he has thought or done something the authorities do not like is enough. For enemies of the people, the nationalists introduced a unique punishment, banning, a form of excommunication. No trial, no appeal to the courts. One man makes the decision, the Minister of Justice. Banning is a term which is used under the Suppression of Communism Act, whereby a person is prohibited from seeing more than one individual at a time. He is prohibited from entering any building where educational material is being prepared or printed or published or distributed. He is prevented from entering any building where uh, a trade union is registered, uh, where he is prevented from entering any area which is prohibited to him, like for instance an African township. He is not allowed to attend any gatherings, including social and political gatherings. He is forced into a situation of spiritual and mental and emotional isolation. He has to live on his own inner resources. He, has, he's felt, he feels that he's rejected by society. And therefore, as a result of that, he simply feels that he withdraws into himself and is not able to live as a normal human being. In fact, it becomes a subhuman existence.